HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is enjoying inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to and continues to gain recognition as a resource for small business owners, entrepreneurs, sales professionals, uh, really, you know, business folks of, of all stripes. This is because of the guests who come on and uh, join me in a conversation. These are folks with expertise in various areas of business, and they give of their time and their knowledge so that all of you can rock it. Uh, Today, my guest is Adam Anderson. Adam is a longtime small business owner who also happens to be one of the leading authorities on small business cybersecurity. This serial entrepreneur is also an author, writing several books on cybersecurity and cybercrime to help other business owners understand and navigate the digital world. Adam's on a mission to help fellow business owners find the answer to the question, Should I even care about cybersecurity? His newest book, The Monster Within, shows business owners that cybersecurity isn't something reserved for only the nerds in Silicon Valley. We all have a stake in this. Thanks for joining me today, Adam. Hey, thank you for having me. I love this topic of cybersecurity, and and what I really love is this uh, concept of uh, we're, we're worrying too much about it, but I, I don't want to get ahead of myself on that because I sure. you know it's a conversation. Uh, we will get there. But I would like to start with um, what you say are three ways to frame the cybersecurity problem, if you would expand on those, please. Yeah, so I like to think of it as the, the, the whole um, – the idea that the problem presents itself in three ways, and it's an external, internal, and philosophical way of thinking about it. And everyone gets the external threat, which is the bad guys are coming, they want to steal your stuff. But that is usually not enough to make anybody act. 
because there's a internal problem that stops you from acting. And that is nobody wants to waste money. No one wants to spend uh, time on something that they don't understand how it's going to provide value. So because of the internal problem where I'm a business owner and I really want to invest in sales and marketing because I like revenue, not expense, I'm not going to be addressing that external threat. But the problem that really drives the, the thing that gets you over the internal is the philosophical. And that's the, the whole point is it's really hard to do what we do. And it is really important that we do what we do. We drive the world's economies being small business and mid-sized business people. And to let yourself be vulnerable because you're not willing to put the effort in to just take the first glance at this issue. Um, it's basically letting somebody else cheat and, and, hit the success that you've worked hard for without having to do the effort. And for me, I have a personal problem with that. I think that that's a great way of looking at it. I, I get that. And, and maybe if more people can look at it that way, uh, that they'll see that it's something worth paying some sort of attention to it, which, you know, I guess we'll get into, but so do, do companies not act, really just because they want to, you know, they'd rather have their money go toward revenue generation as opposed to being what they think is just an expense or, you know, is, is it, is there more to it? I sort of feel yeah. like for some it, it's that head in the sand sort of thing. Oh, absolutely. Then, you know, the root cause of that head in the sand is uh, typically comes from a victim mentality. And I usually don't like to use that word because victim is kind of negative. But when you don't understand something and it seems like it's a real big issue, you'd rather work on something else. So head in the sand is a much better way of putting it because most business owners believe the same three things. Uh, I don't have anything anyone would want nobody's looking for me and I can't stop them even I want to. So I should go work on something else. Oh, that's so interesting. I can totally see that. Mm -hmm. But, but okay. So, so wait, hang on a second. Cause I want, I want to tie that back to what you said a minute ago about you're letting someone take what you've been working so hard. So you may think that no one really wants what you have it's like the value proposition isn't there but that's not what it's about is it that's correct i mean it, it used to be if you believe that a hacker or a cyber criminal is trying to steal some intellectual property and sell it to a, a different nation state or get in there and steal important data and you don't have that kind of stuff then you're safe that actually was probably true a couple of years ago but most uh, cyber criminals have gone through a, a process of innovation and all they care about now is your money. And guess what? We have a lot of money in this market and we're really bad at cybersecurity. So the majority of the attacks these days are targeting the small companies. We just don't get in the newspapers. Okay. Uh, so it's so great because we hear about like major cities with mm -hmm. the ransom where like Atlanta, didn't Atlanta get nailed and they, you know, paid to get their stuff back. And mm -hmm. I know I've heard of school systems that it happens to, but you're right. We don't really hear about it with small business, which I guess makes us more vulnerable. Yeah. We are actually truly gifted at how bad we are at cybersecurity. It's, it's, so <laughs> <amazing>. <laughs> And I actually think that's a good thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Um, you know, like, like I said earlier, it is hard running a small business and um, it's really easy to react out of fear and buy a whole bunch of software and services to give yourself the illusion of security and overspend on this thing when what you really should do is probably go to another conference and networking event and close another deal. So... Right. You know, that, that's kind of my whole message about this thing is cybersecurity is not a computer science problem. It's a behavioral science problem, which means we can approach it with business systems and not with technology. Okay, great. I, I want you to talk about that because th this is, I, I think this is why you say we're worrying too much about cybersecurity, about cybercrime. What we mm -hmm. should be doing is 
really focusing in on our business processes. So, so talk about what you mean by that. Yeah, so the whole purpose of cybersecurity is to, to layer technology on top of business processes to make sure they happen. I'll give you an example. Um, okay. The business I just sold, we did uh, identity and access management, meaning we handled all the username and passwords for Fortune 500 companies. And in order for my nerds to have their usernames and passwords on their laptops, it was going to be like a $10,000 laptop with all the security things and all the, the bells and whistles. And I'm like, yeah, what if we just changed the process? What if we created a policy that said none of my employees would touch anyone's data unless I was on the computers of the customers and we just wouldn't have them on our laptops. And the customer said, sure. So that was it. They shipped us their laptops with their security on it. And instead of spending $10,000 for a really fancy secure laptop, I changed my policy and I moved liability back to the customer. So I love changing your business process to remove the expense of cybersecurity. You s now, we're still secure, right? I still had the problem right. solved, but it's not on my dime. And it's in a way that's in a partnership with my customers, not with me trying to handle everything. And your customer already had that in place, most likely, or yeah. putting it in place. Well, it was already in place. And by me letting that happen, I was able to close the deal faster because they could skip all of the procurement processes where they had to audit my cybersecurity. Oh, right. Right. Which anymore, when you do business with certain organizations, you have to be able to prove. Oh, yeah. Yeah, how you're cybersecure. That's really interesting. Okay. So... Let's talk some about compliance because I have a, a friend who's in the IT space and he, he marvels at how many companies are not compliant, like are not, um, what are they, like HIPAA compliant or there's some yeah, other. PCI. PCI, right, 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 right. Sarbanes so, so that feels like it falls in with, with cybercrime as well. That, that it's just this whole philosophy around, is it because we don't understand it? I mean, what is going on here? Well, so we talked about fear being a driver that makes you want to buy the illusion of security to make you feel good. Yeah. Well, yeah. compliance is buying security to make someone else safe. If you are PCI compliant, you have significantly reduced the risk of the credit card industry losing money, but you have done nothing to reduce your risk of getting hacked. So a lot of the times, these companies don't spend money on compliance because their cybersecurity teams come back and say, yeah, it, it won't actually help you. It's really helping them. Now for HIPAA, that's different because that's trying to protect the identities and the information in healthcare. Yeah. But the vast majority of compliances are coming from large organizations who are trying to reduce their risks. And they're saying, if you don't do these things, we're not going to work with them. Okay. Okay. So they're really driving the bus and the mm -hmm. small business owner. Is it, is it expensive? I mean, is that, can it be cost prohibitive for a small business owner to then be able to do business with those sorts of organizations? It can be, but especially with PCI, I mean, so PCI, for those who don't know, this is the credit card companies giving a bunch of, it's called payment card industry. And these are the things you have to, to follow if you want to take credit cards. And I have a dentist friend and she has not been PCI compliant for, oh, I don't know, maybe 18 months. And they're like, no, no, you can keep doing it, but we're going to give you a penalty of $150 a month while you're not compliant. And for her, that cost is so low compared to what it would cost to actually get compliant that she's basically now paying a membership fee to take credit cards. And so I have a real problem with some of the way that compliance is enforced yeah. on the small business because it almost seems like a racket to me. Yeah, because you either need to be compliant or mm -hmm. right, there's either really a need for it or not. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. The things we don't know. Okay, so, so talk to me about these monsters 
which I believe are what our beliefs about risk mm -hmm. and right. And and they determine how we approach things like cybersecurity. Yeah. So, you know, where I like to approach cybersecurity from is what you believe drives your emotion, your emotion state drives your behavior, and then your behavior over time leads to habit. So your beliefs, like we talked about, I'm not important. I can't stop them. Uh, no one's looking for me. Those are going to make yeah. you act in a certain way, but it's completely reasonable to live in these different states of belief. And I have an analogy I love. It's um, how we perceive monsters. So back in the day, uh, monsters only attacked you and came at you when you traveled, like when you're in the wilderness or on the ocean. And if that's your viewpoint, then you think, as long as I don't go to places on the internet, I shouldn't go, I'm going to be safe and I don't have to worry about cybercrime. So that's one belief. The second belief is uh, more of the village mentality where, you know, my house is safe, but my neighbors may not be. It's a small village. I'm definitely not trusting uh, strangers. So here you think that the entire internet is dangerous and you have to be real careful who you trust. And then the third is the monsters inside. So the movie Scream, do you guys, you remember that? The, uh, mm -hmm. So that was the first time where the monster was actually in the house where he, uh, the, the bad guy says, you know, on the phone, I'm in your house. <laughs> right. And that to me is the key because you can't control those other two beliefs. But when you know that the monster is actually how you think about cybersecurity that makes you unsafe. Well, the good news is you can actually modify those beliefs. Those three things I said, if you know that those beliefs are standing in the way of you getting safe or just reducing risk, we're not ever going to be safe, but we want to reduce risk and reduce liability. Well, this is good news because you can modify those beliefs. And to me, I love that whole imagery of these monsters everywhere. But the one that really is important to address is the one inside. Yeah, that, that's really, that is great. And the great thing about that is that it is empowering. So you don't feel like you don't have any choices anymore. You feel like, okay, now I really can do something about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. All right, I'm going to take a quick sponsor break and then I have some questions about that. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash business growth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Transform Your Company by Alex Vorobiev and The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients by David A. Field. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're speaking with Adam Anderson about cybersecurity and your business. So <laughs> let's talk about the biggest cyber risks. Because sure. you know, when you talk about these various monsters and things, I'm I'm curious about in reality to a small business what's the biggest cyber risk so this is typically where most people want me to go into like ransomware and wanna cry and different hacking techniques and they really want me to nerd out and impress them with my industry knowledge um, I have good and bad news. It's not that hard. Uh, it's actually the number one risk is your employees clicking on something they shouldn't. And that, okay. <laughs> yeah, now that, so why that is bad is that is the attack vector. That is how they are going to get you to install the ransomware, to install the viruses, all of that stuff, right? But it all starts with a click. And 75% of all small business employees are highly likely to click on something they shouldn't. Even when they're told not to. 
<laughs> well, let's talk about how training works, right? So yeah. I, let's say you invite me in. I'm ruggedly handsome. I'm, I've got a rock and PowerPoint, maybe even a soundtrack, and I entertain your employees, and they all believe when they walk out that door, I'm not going to click on anything. And they do a great job for almost three months, and yeah. then they forget. So the reason, so this is what's really gotten me excited is we have, um, I've got a new product that we're doing and it's uh, continuous email phishing attacks. I will attack your employees multiple times a quarter with fake cyber attacks. And if they ever click on one, they go to a two minute training video. So to me, <laughs> oh, that's so right? Great. right? Yeah. And so to me, yeah. That's how you defeat this phishing attack. So that's yeah. what it's called is, uh, is phishing or spear phishing where someone says, hey, you need to do this wire transfer. And it kind of looks like it's the CEO's email. And it sounds a lot like the CEO. And so the CFO or the controller does the wire transfer. And I can't tell you how many close friends who have businesses who have had to do that. Or here's the Starbucks gift card. Download your PDF and da, da, da. Right? Yeah they're getting very, very good at sending emails that aren't, hey, I am the prince of uh, Nairobi and I have $50 million, right? Those old things. Yeah. Sophisticated now. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, so I love this whole idea of, of you know, constantly hitting them. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so, but to, to add on to that, what does good cybersecurity in a business look like? So I have a list of seven really easy to do, very inexpensive things, but I won't dive into that because that tends to make people's eyes glaze over. So let me summarize uh -huh. instead. And I can jump into that. I want, and I want to, but I call it practicing good cyber hygiene. It's the boring, basic blocking and tackling things that you're probably not doing, but you could probably start doing in less than a few days. Um, and so I'll actually, I will just run through it. Um, the very first one is backups. Uh, you need to make sure that your important data and that changes based off of your company so if you're a, a solopreneur who does a whole bunch of documents and you have everything on uh, google drive you're probably okay however if you are running your email off of your laptop and you don't have good backups or you have a special database that you use uh, you're putting yourself at risk so a jump drive plugged into your computer or an external hard drive plugged into your computer is not a backup because not only can the cyber folks get to that, but also things like fire. So I tell people when you're doing backups, go buy a backup as a service that makes all of your important stuff go somewhere else. And you have an adult who is not you be responsible for that data getting backed up and you pay whatever extra price is there to make sure that after something goes wrong, they'll help you get it back. So backups are number one. Um, the second thing is having a really good cybersecurity insurance policy. So ah. I, I'm basically saying then, look, uh, you've already, you're already sick. Something's already happened. The virus has hit you. And so you're going to use backups to recover, but you don't know how to recover. And you need the cybersecurity insurance policy, not because it's going to give you money, Good news, you have a million dollars and you have no idea who to call, right? So yeah. <laughs> you don't want an insurance policy that gives you money. You want an insurance policy that covers your damages and provides a disaster response team made up of a uh, cyber lawyer, a cyber PR person, a cyber uh, white hat hacker, a forensic investigator, and a system admin. And what this team is going to do is respond put you back together, find out what went wrong, help you talk to your customers and help you lower your legal liability. So that, that is, if you have those two things, if you don't have either one of those, if you do those two things, there is not a whole lot that you can't recover from. And that to me is critical because it's yeah. going to happen to you. I want you to be able to take a hit and get back up. So backups and cybersecurity insurance policy. But if you don't even want to get sick, then I suggest you move everything you can to the cloud. 
So if you have email on your desktop or on your laptop, move that Outlook or move whatever mail client you're doing to online. I use Gmail for everything. A lot of my friends use Microsoft. Folks use iCloud. Just move as much as you can. Um, the catch to that is people push back and say, yeah, but Adam, these big companies get hacked all the time. I'm like, you're absolutely right. But they're still so much better at this than you are. And think about the marketing, right? Would you rather say, I'm sorry, all of my customers, the computer I keep in my garage got hacked and now all of your personal data is gone. Or say, hey, I don't know what to tell you. Amazon got hacked. Everyone is uh, um, yeah. up there, right? <laughs> And what, those are the same message, but yeah. so different, right? So you move everything to the cloud, but now your your uh, single point of failure is your username and password. If they get your username and password, they have access to everything. So you secure this by using something called two-factor authentication. And two-factor authentication is when you have a username, a password, and then a different factor of authentication. Um, back in the day, I'm actually looking at it on my desk right now. I have a Wells Fargo uh, RSA token that has like eight digits and it changes constantly and I have to type it in every time, right? But with Gmail and Microsoft, I actually have an app on my phone. Anytime I log into my email, my phone pops up and says, hey, Adam, someone's trying to log into your Gmail. Is this you? And I hit yes. So I don't care if you get my username and password. I don't care if my assistant accidentally leaks my username and password because without my phone or the RSA token or that second factor, you can't get in anyway. So ah. move everything to the cloud, get a two factor authentication for everything you can move to the cloud. And then the last thing is automatic patching on updates on your computers and devices because you can't move everything, right? Not everything can right. go to the cloud. Right. So the good news is that Microsoft, Apple, all these guys are really good at putting security patches out. And if you enable automatic updates and you turn on the basic security features of your operating system or your device, you're probably 99% safe, but only if you allow them to continue update it. Um, I'm actually guilty of not doing that. So I was in the middle of doing my slide deck for my TED talk and I was in the zone being super creative and amazing. And then my computer popped up and said, would you like to reboot for the security patch? And I had a conundrum because I was about to talk and tell people. <laughs> to do it. I'm not going to tell you what I did. I'm not going to tell you. Uh, so now I know what you did. <laughs> you know exactly what I did. I said, no. Because <laughs> here's the thing. Cybersecurity is only valuable if it doesn't disrupt your business. If you're doing all this stuff and it prevents you from doing your job, then you've done too much. Make sure there's a business case and make sure that the, the liability that you're trying to avoid is not um, causing you even more liability in your company from not being able to, you know, put together a PowerPoint that's going to make you money. So that's an aside. Yeah, so, boy. Yeah, but right. that's a really good point. I, I Right? I mean, look, yeah. at the end, end of the day, business wins. If the business case doesn't justify the security control, don't do it. And yeah. if you don't understand why you're doing it and you can't justify it on a spreadsheet and you can't have a real intelligent business decision happening, just don't do it. And you might be leaving yourself vulnerable to the boogeyman, but chances are you're not. Just do these things I'm telling you and you can, you can then slow down and be more intentional with your strategic planning. So we were just saying, uh, update your stuff. Yeah. So now we're getting to what I think is the, probably the most important thing to keep you safe. And that is to not log into your computers as administrators. What I mean by that is by default, when I sit down on a brand new laptop, Microsoft gives me the keys to the kingdom. I can install any software I want. I am the boss of this machine. But when I click on something that I shouldn't, it uses my role, my administrator role, to install all the bad stuff. So I always, the first thing I do is I create a user account on the computer that doesn't have all of those really powerful rights. And next thing you know, I can click on anything I want because I no longer have permission to hurt myself. Um, it's like putting a, a cork at the end of a fork and handing it to a kid. Sure, they can do some bad things with it, but at least they can't stab themselves. So right. 
So human behavior is going to happen. We're going to make mistakes. So safeguard yourself by making sure if you do make a mistake, uh, you're safe. Um, so then the, the last thing that I like to talk about is uh, training for social engineering. At the end of the day, if people don't click on things, they don't hurt themselves. And then the majority of the viruses that are going to hurt you um, that are coming from outside, if you do these other things, you're going to be okay. But you're still worried about the human factor. Again, cybercrime isn't about computer science. It's about behavioral science, which means if you are not training your employees and conditioning your employees, then you're behind the ball. Um, so really paying attention to that. And then the last thing is make a plan, right? No surgeon goes into a room to uh, operate on a body on a human without actually having a plan. And this is when you should go find a smart person who understands business and cybersecurity and make sure you align what you're trying to accomplish and what makes sense as far as security goes. And I, I actually, I don't even mean that for cyber. I mean that for security in general. I mean, sometimes yeah. you should spend more money on the lock on the door than you do on the, uh, the uh, firewall on the router. Right, right. Okay. Will you talk some about um, VPNs mm -hmm. for when people aren't in the office, like they're at a coffee shop or whatever? Yes. Um, very simply, you need a VPN. There. <laughs> <laughs> so it stands for Virtual Private Network. And what it does is let's, so I'll walk through a real example. I love okay. coffee. And I'm not going to lie, I will buy an expensive Starbucks latte. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to sit there and I'm going to work. And I'm going to be connecting to my Gmail and I'm going to be doing emails and I'll be touching social media. And I will use the Starbucks network because it's there. Mm -hmm. Now, if at all possible, don't do that. Tether to your phone, use some other thing, but often convenience wins. The step I take to make sure I'm safe is I turn on my VPN. And I've bought one. It's uh, the product's Advast. I, I think it's free. I'm not 100% sure. It could be like 45 bucks. I'm not suggesting the product, but it's the one I use. And it automatically protects and encrypts me. So whenever I send traffic to the internet, I go through the Advast servers first. What this does is it prevents people from sitting on that network and seeing everything you're doing. And I'll tell you a quick horror story that has a happy ending. Um, I sent some of my nerds to a convention called Takedown Con in Vegas. And they came back with these really new fancy iPad 2s. That's right, iPad 2s, that's how long ago this was. And they said, Adam, we have learned how to hijack Facebook sessions on public networks using iPads. I can now assume your identity on Facebook and take over your message board and your timeline and change all of your personal information. Isn't that cool? I said, no, that's horrifying. <laughs> you give me those iPads right now. <laughs> so this, this is out there, right? And so wow. never connect on a public network without a VPN. And if all possible, use a tethered data connection from a source you control, such as your phone and your internet provider that your phone's connected to. But even in that case, I often have a VPN on my phone and I double up. Okay. So. Okay. That's great. That's great. Cause I, I've heard about, I mean, I have one because I was told that I needed one. And so <laughs> I did it. And then, but I never really, quite understood what it was doing for me and if it was really um, helping keep me safe. Yeah, it's cre it creates a tunnel that it, uh, is an encrypted tunnel from your computer to the thing you're trying to work with. And anyone who looks at your data or looks at that tunnel, it's, it's dark to them and they can't get in. And that's the key is that if you are not creating that tunnel, your stuff goes out there in clear text and depending on what you're doing, it's very, very easy to hijack that stuff and um, see what you're doing or even control it. Okay. Okay. Now, this may sound like a strange question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Some people think that if they are on their phone and their phone is not on Wi-Fi, so it's on 
you know, whatever, 4G or whatever it is, mm-hmm. that um, that they can, like, log into their bank and stuff like that. Is is that the case or is that stupid? Well, God, I hope so because that's what I do. <laughs> so. <laughs> So okay. the, the, the reason why that is safer, and it's not 100% safe. So remember, when we're limiting liability, we're limiting with business processes. I bank with a bank that makes sure that I have liability coverage if I get hacked. So the technology is very important, but it's much more important to be banking with the right bank. So I'll just put that out there. Great. But uh, yeah, so your internet provider, like I'm using Verizon, I go over Verizon's networks. Verizon has security in place and the bank app is often very, very secure and has encryption all the way to the back end. So I'm using Wells Fargo in this case. So you have multiple layers by default that these people have put in. The thing that you're really worried about is have you downloaded a fake app? Are you using the right thing? There are... uh, A quick example of how a bunch of usernames and passwords got captured is they, a couple years ago, a hacking group put out a fake banking app for a major bank and people started downloading it on Android and they would install it and they would log in and it wouldn't work and they would go, huh, and they would go and try again and get the right app now it's working well they collected hundreds of thousands of oh, usernames and passwords because wow. every time you tried to log in it just sent you sent that information to the back end servers so and by the way that was it cost them about twenty five hundred dollars to develop and deploy that solution oh my goodness so cybercrime wow. is more about project management because you can outsource all this stuff on the dark web than it is about being good at computers which is one of the reasons uh-huh. why the three beliefs are no longer applicable because if I can create a virus or if I can create an attack for $2,500 that I can attack hundreds of thousands of small businesses, you know that so many are being created every day. Right. Sure. That's, the, that's part of what's scary about it. Mm-hmm. Oy, oy, oy. This is so, I mean, it's not great because it's a really scary thing. But having you here to explain this stuff has really been great because it 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 feels um, more not as scary. Let me say it that way. That that it's something that we can actually safeguard ourselves to a pretty good degree if we are um, thoughtful and proactive about the things that we do. Yes. Uh, tough decisions. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. You, you know what's really scary? Marketing. Well, Marketing is scary. <laughs> <laughs> Cyber yes, sec- right? It is, right? <laughs> Cybersecurity so is true. not scary. It is just a list of policies. Hey, we shouldn't do that. Match with procedures. All right, if we're not going to do that, here's what we're going to do. Supported by technology and security controls that make sure you're not going to do it and report on it um, if you have to. And it's... If you can come up with a flow chart, you can do cybersecurity. And it does seem scary um, because I basically also described marketing, right? So shouldn't I be able to do that? But I guarantee you, I hire a marketer. I hire a marketing firm. I hire a strategic planner. Look, if it's outside your your skill set, you can either try to become an expert in it or you can pay an expert. And personally for me, marketing is something I pay for help with. And maybe for your listeners or, I mean, pay somebody to help you create a cybersecurity plan and then sleep better at night. Okay. So I, I totally agree with you, but if, if they're feeling like, okay, yeah, I don't want to do it alone, but I also don't want to spend a fortune on it because mm-hmm. you know, I don't have a fortune or that's not where I want my fortune to go, whatever. Um, what do you tell them? What do you suggest? I typically, well, let, let's, talk money first, right? So hiring a fractional chief security officer, like a part-time chief security officer can be very expensive. And it's outside of the bandwidth for the majority of small business owners. So where can I get free advice? Let's go back to our um, 
cybersecurity insurance policies. When you are filling out the um, application, it asks you a whole bunch of questions. But the very first question is, do you have a business continuity plan? And the second is, do you have a disaster recovery plan? And I just so happen to be a wonderful human being and have created a spreadsheet that you can fill out and check both of those boxes. So the business continuity plan is a first column is here's all my business systems, sales and marketing, HR, you know, finance, et cetera, et cetera. The next column is, all right, write down all of your business processes. All right, payroll, my website, the list goes on. Now list all the software. Now list all of the different data. Now list the humans. Now you have a subjective risk score. And at the end of that, and so I have a, a demonstration online that shows you how to do this and walks through an example of a CPA and what it looks like for them. Um, by the way, they also have a marriage litigation uh, practice and part of their data, it said the tears of the divorced. And I was like, well, maybe this isn't the best example. <laughs> so, I mean, it, this is serious, but don't take it too serious, okay? Right. <laughs> And so by building out and you realize I haven't said a single thing about cybersecurity. Now yeah. I have this business continuity plan that effectively shows where my risk is and there's a heat map and it's fantastic. And you take that to your managed service provider, take it to your IT nerd, your, the, the, whoever you have helping you and say, I can show you where my risk is. Can you please help me lower these risks? And they're going to be able to have such a better conversation because you're owning wow. the strategy at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, very much. Yeah. Wow. That, that is terrific. And once again, empowering and, you know, people, then the business owner feels like they have some sort of uh, control over it. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Wow. That's great. It took us about... I would say nine to 10 hours over a couple of days to fill out that business continuity plan and to the level of detail we had. And it took probably the, uh, the way I would do it. I would send it to the uh, different people responsible for each system and make them do it. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't take sure. responsibility for this. You should run your company, not fill out spreadsheets. Right, 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 right. Plus those people are the ones who are going to know best. That's the truth. What, yeah, what they're doing. Great. Wow. This is so great. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for sharing this information. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it puts such a different spin on it that is really terrific. Um, and will you let the listeners know, you know, how they can find you and where they can get your books and Absolutely. all that great stuff? Yeah, so um, head on over to elementsecuritygroup.com slash AYBG. And all the stuff that I've talked about, the assessments, the spreadsheets, we've got a whole lot of free tools for you to grab. It'll show you how to get my very well-written and easy-to-understand cybersecurity book. I don't think there is one, actually. I don't think there is an easy-to-understand cybersecurity yeah. book. Yeah, <laughs> I don't either. Um, but I, I really have been enjoying, um, I've got a YouTube channel that I've been working on for about six months that are one-minute business videos because, in my opinion, the better you do business, the better positioned you are yeah. to do cybersecurity. So I'm walking people through how do you build a sales funnel and what does that look like? And these are one minute videos over at Adam Anderson, CEO. And that's my Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Um, also LinkedIn. Um, and I post every, every morning a one minute um, video. Oh, that's awesome. That is great. Wow. Terrific. Oh, thanks. So, as I said, I mean, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is really, really valuable and, and not talked about enough. So, uh, and, and speaking of not talked about enough, I also want to thank the listeners. Uh, I think you guys got an awful lot of great information here today and go find Adam and, uh, you know, don't, don't finish listening to this and just move on. Go ahead and take some action. You'll sleep better at night and so will all of your employees and Anyone else who is connected to you, who cares about you. Um, I also want to thank our sponsor. Uh, please remember, if you would like to get 
a free trial and a free audio book, uh, go to audibletrial.com slash business growth. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate, the podcast that asks you what you want to be when you grow up so you can graduate into retirement with a purpose and a passion, whether you're 25, 85, or any age in between. Gain actionable financial and mindset tips from your favorite authors, podcasters, and influencers to help you reach that exciting next chapter. Listen now and start building your path to financial freedom and reframing what retirement can mean to you. This is your host, Eric Brotman, reminding you, don't retire, graduate.